Okay, I left this problem as an exercise at the end of last class. And uh, I want to go through it because I think it's, uh, it's got an interesting um, sort of addition to the intermediate value theorem uh, that can be pretty useful in some situations. So the idea here is um, you're looking at this function, it's x over x cubed plus 1, and you think to yourself, okay, I want to show that it's, uh, it's going to have the output value of negative 100 somewhere. Well, negative 100 is sort of a big value. Um, it's not huge, but, you know, it's not like 1 or 2 or something uh, uh, relatively small. So um, you might think to yourself that maybe this should be happening somewhere toward one of the infinities, right? Toward negative uh, uh, x, you know, x going toward negative infinity or x going toward positive infinity. And uh, if you check that, or you can check the, the limit as x goes to plus or minus infinity of, uh, of this function. And in both cases, um, as we saw in, in class before, since the uh, degree of the denominator uh, is larger than the degree of the numerator, this thing is, uh, the, the denominator is going to grow much faster than the numerator, and this thing is actually going to uh, asymptote down to zero at plus and minus infinity. Um, you can go through the details of that, of course. Uh, what I just said out loud is not necessarily a... a a valid argument for that, but it's the intuitive idea for why uh, this thing goes to zero asymptotically at uh, plus and minus infinity. So that means that this value of negative 100, uh, if it is attained, it has to be attained somewhere in the middle ground, right? It's got to be attained somewhere between uh, plus and minus infinity, which isn't really saying too much, but uh, it means that we've got to look for a, a sort of a specific x value where this actually uh, might happen. So. Uh, if you're thinking to yourself, okay, I need to show that this function actually attains the value of negative 100 somewhere, um, I tried to think, you know, maybe it's going to get large uh, when x is really large, either in the positive or negative direction. That didn't work. So instead, uh, think about another way that this function can become quite large. Right? This is uh, sort of the hint that I left you with at the end of class. Well, <clears throat> one way that this function or any function in particular, uh, uh, this function in particular, or any function in general, I should say, uh, can become quite large is uh, if you ever accidentally divide by zero, right? This could be a problem. Um, in particular, if you get a vertical asymptote, right? Um, then your uh, function could either go to infinity on one side of it or negative infinity on one side of it. And if you're going all the way down to negative infinity, for instance, well, you're probably going to hit negative 100 along the way. So this is the idea for uh, how this is going to go. And uh, if we check for vertical asymptotes here, uh, we want x cubed uh, plus 1 to be equal to 0, because we want to be dividing by 0 to check for vertical asymptotes. <clears throat> and that happens uh, only when, well, yeah, this happens only for the real value, x equals negative 1. All right, so we've got a vertical asymptote at x equals negative 1, all we need to do to, to sort of make ourselves believe that negative 100 is hit somewhere is to figure out how this function x over x cubed plus 1, how it actually behaves on either side of that asymptote. Um, for instance, if it goes to positive infinity from both sides, then that doesn't necessarily answer our question because it never becomes really large and negative. And so if we can figure out that this function is going to negative infinity on one or both sides, of, uh, of this vertical asymptote at x equals negative 1, well, then we'd be in business. All right, so we've got a vertical asymptote at x equals negative 1. So now uh, what we want to do is we want to check the limit as x goes to 1, uh, I'm sorry, negative 1, from both sides of our function. All right, so we want to check it from the left and from the right. And what we're really doing here in, in specifying which side we're approaching from, we're going to be able to basically just check the sign of the denominator and check the sign of the numerator and see whether the whole fraction is staying positive or if it's negative, because we know it has to be going to one of the infinities uh, as we approach it from one side or the other. Right? We're going to have negative 1 over 0 in a sense. And so this has to be going to one of the infinities. The question is which one? All right, so if x is uh, going to negative 1 from the left, well, this means that x is less than negative 1. 
right? So it's more negative than negative one. Uh, you know, x could be negative 1.5 or negative 1.1, right? These are examples of x values that are valid here. So uh, that means that x cubed, right? This means that x cubed is gonna be less than negative one cubed, which is still negative one. You have to be careful with the uh, inequality here since we're cubing this value. Uh, that really means we're multiplying it by itself uh, three times. And so we're gonna have, um, right, everything that's already negative will stay negative. That's why this inequality didn't switch. In general, you have to be careful with this, right? If we had squared this, uh, if x is say negative two, for instance, uh, and we squared both sides of this inequality, well then negative two squared becomes positive four, which is now bigger than negative one squared, which is one. Right, so you have to be a little bit careful here. Um, you know, don't uh, don't just try to fly through these calculations uh, like an automaton. You you want to be uh, careful and uh, very um, aware and intentional when you do these things. All right, so um, x that means that x cubed uh, is less than negative one still. The the inequality didn't switch, and so if we just add one to the other side, we see that x cubed plus one, and we care about this because that's our denominator, this is a negative quantity. So we've got that our uh, denominator is negative, and right, I'm just sort of doing this off to the side here just so we have a sense for what's going on. Um, maybe I'll use a different color to indicate that it's not actual math. And I'm not multiplying by anything, I'm just trying to figure out what the signs are. And so I just turned that minus to a plus. In my mind here. The denominator is negative and uh, the numerator is just x itself and as x goes to negative 1 it's certainly going to be negative, right? x is really close to negative 1 and so it's going to be a negative quantity. And so here this fraction looks like negative over negative. That means that this fraction uh, is negative over negative which is positive. Since it's going to one of the infinities and it stays positive the whole time as x goes to negative 1 from the left that means it must be going to positive infinity. All right, so this, let me use white again, this limit is exactly equal, <laughs> or as equal as something can be, uh, to positive infinity. Okay, so let's check the other side. Uh, so here we're also checking the limit as x goes to uh, negative one from the right of our function, which is x over x cubed plus 1. Now, using the exact same kind of analysis, right, we know it's going to one of the infinities. The question is which one. And so we know that x is bigger than negative 1 if it's approaching negative 1 from the right. Uh, this means that x could be values like negative 0 0.5, negative 0 0.9, things like that. And that means that, if uh, again, if I cube both sides, x cubed is still going to be bigger than negative 1. And adding 1 to both sides, that means that my denominator, x cubed plus 1, this whole denominator is going to be a positive quantity now. Now again, our uh, numerator, as x goes to negative 1 from the right, we're imagining x is going to negative 1 uh, from the right, and it's really close to negative 1. Uh, again, like negative 0.9, negative 0.99, things like that. Well, in particular, for us, all that really matters uh, is that uh, this numerator, x, as it goes to negative 1, is negative. All right, so we've got, doing our sort of sign analysis here, we've got a negative numerator. We have now a positive denominator. We know that we're going to uh, a non-zero number divided by 0, so it has to be one of the infinities. The fraction is negative the whole way in uh, as x goes to negative 1 from the right. Therefore... Uh, this is going to negative infinity. Okay, so uh, generally speaking, right, if we, if we want to get a sort of pictorial sense for what's going on, we've got our vertical asymptote at negative 1. And now what we've seen is that as we approach negative 1 from the right, we go down to minus infinity. I don't necessarily know about the behavior of this function anywhere else, but I do know that right really close to negative 1, it's sort of dive-bombing down to negative infinity. And over here, uh, we found that as we approach negative 1 from the left, we go to positive infinity, 
and so really close to <coughs> to uh, uh, to negative one from the left, this function is going to shoot up to uh, positive infinity. All right. So what is the what is our intuition sort of uh, uh, guiding us to here? Well, this function is going to negative infinity from uh, as x goes to uh, negative one from the right. And if you're going all the way down to negative infinity, that means that you know somewhere down here where there's this value of negative 100 on the y-axis, well, that means that somewhere down there, this function is going to cross that value. And so what this means is that there's gonna be some x value, which is probably really, really close to negative one uh, as, uh, on the right side of it. So like negative 0.9999, for instance, uh, where this function x over x cubed plus one does actually cross this line and attain the value of negative 100. Now, the big idea here is that we want to use uh, the intermediate value theorem, right? Because this is just a question of existence, right? It's purely a question of existence. I'm not asking you to find the value x where this is attained. We just want to know that it does exist. So we've got one theorem so far in class that tells us, uh, that answers questions that are purely of existence, and that is the intermediate value theorem. So what we need here is a function. We've got a function. Um, we need an interval uh, to consider. And we need this function to be continuous on that interval. Right? That's really uh, the important sort of stumbling point that we're going to run into. We need continuity. So uh, for the IVT, right, we need function, we need an interval, and we need f of a to not be equal to f of b, uh, and f has to be continuous on that closed interval. So what we're saying here is as uh, for our function in particular, as x goes to negative 1 from the right, well, we know that somewhere, as it goes to negative 1 from the right, we're going to cross this horizontal line at a uh, height negative 100. But you run into a problem here, because this function is not actually continuous at x equals negative 1. We've got a vertical asymptote there. So that means that we're not going to be able, right, unless we really do some, some hard algebra here, which we saw in class really is hard uh, to solve this question with an exact value. Uh, unless we want to do some really hard algebra, we're going to have to sort of adapt our intermediate value theorem to fit a situation like this. All right, so a quick observation. All right, this function is rational. It's a polynomial x over another polynomial x cubed plus 1. And that means that uh, by what we've seen in class maybe six weeks ago, uh, this function is, is continuous um, on its domain, meaning everywhere you don't accidentally divide by zero. And so this function is definitely continuous as long as we avoid this uh, vertical asymptote at negative one. All right, so f is continuous on negative one all the way up to infinity. Since negative one is our only vertical asymptote, it's the only x value that we have to avoid. Now, the same thing is going to be true for negative 1 down to negative infinity, but notice that uh, that's not necessarily the interval that we want to care about because uh, our function is going to positive infinity on the left side of negative 1, and the good side of negative 1 is the right side where it's going down to negative infinity. All right, so uh, this is probably the interval that we really care about. Even though it is true that it's still continuous uh, from negative infinity up to negative 1, we probably only care about the right-hand side. All right. So we observe this, and so we want to sort of be able to use the intermediate value theorem, but notice that uh, the intermediate value theorem requires a closed interval. So here's sort of the, the big idea for how we can generalize the mean value theorem just a little bit, sort of tweak it so that it fits our situation. We've got a function which is continuous uh, on an open interval, and we know that since it's continuous on this open interval, uh, just intuitively speaking, it's got to, you know, on this one side where it's going down to negative infinity, it's got to dive bomb down and it's got to cross this line at, uh, at negative 100 at some point. So how do we make this rigorous? 
right? We can't actually plug negative one in there. That doesn't make any sense. And that's what we have to do for, to satisfy the statement of the uh, intermediate value theorem. So what we're gonna do instead is uh, we're going to say, what's the next best thing to being able to plug in the endpoint of this interval? Well, we've got a notion of limits. And uh, limits sort of generalize the idea of being able to actually take a value and plug it into a function and get some specific height out of it. Or what we do instead uh, with a limit is we see, okay, the heights on the function are going to some place as I let my x value get arbitrarily close to whatever the uh, x value in question is. In this case, it'll be negative one. Right, so as we get, as x gets really, really, really arbitrarily close to negative one, where are the function values going? Right, if we could actually plug negative one in, this function being continuous would tell us that we should get the exact same value in the limit. We can't plug negative one into this, so let's replace being able to plug negative one in by just taking a limit, which is the next best thing. All right, so uh, note here, that's a limit as x goes to negative one from the right. Uh, we have to specify that it's from the right so that we live inside this interval of x over x cubed plus one. This is, that's a terrible infinity. This is negative infinity. So if we want to be able to use the intermediate value theorem or this new generalized form of it, uh, we want to be able to use the intermediate value theorem. Uh, we need to just pick an x value that's somewhere to the right of negative one. And we want uh, our value, our output value that we care about, which is negative 100, to be in between negative infinity and this other value, right? This other output value for this other x value that we're going to pick. All right, so um, we, we could pick a ton of different things here, right? We have lots of options. Um, for this function, uh, the way it's defined, I think x equals zero might be a, a good option. All right, so if we, uh, uh, if we compute, right, and this is really just guess and check at this point. I, I don't necessarily know this is going to work. I just need to find some other x value where I can say, okay, on this interval, good things happen. So uh, I'm just gonna try f of zero and I get zero over zero cubed plus one, I get zero. So the way we're gonna uh, sort of use this generalized idea of the intermediate value theorem is by saying the following. F, our original function, is continuous. On the, open inter on the, the left open interval, so it's open at negative one, and we can close it at zero because we can actually plug zero into this function. So it's continuous on this half open, half closed interval. And here's where we uh, sort of generalize the, the uh, intermediate value theorem a little bit. If we look at not the function value at negative one because we can't plug it in there, but if we look instead at the next best thing, which is the limit, well, this is, right, if we remind ourselves, this is negative infinity. So we have negative infinity is less than the value that we care about. And that is less than zero because it's a negative number. So this is less than f of zero. All right, so uh, the, the key thing here is that we've replaced plugging in negative one like we would if we were using the, uh, the standard statement of the intermediate value theorem. We've replaced it by the next best thing. All right, the next best thing to plug negative one into this function is taking a limit on one side of it. All right, so we've got that uh, the output value that we care about, negative 100, is somewhere in between um, this limit as x goes to negative one from the right and f of zero, which we chose um, uh, as our right endpoint. And finally, what this means right, by the sort of new IBT, uh, F, uh, there, sorry, let's be uh, exact about this. There is at least one C value 
in this interval that we were looking at, which is left open at a negative one and closed at zero, for which f of c must be negative 100. Sort of ran out of room there, and I apologize. Um, but this is really the important thing. All right, so uh, just to recap, the, the big ideas here were that um, we're trying to find a place where this function is reasonably large, in this case, large and negative, right, negative 100. So uh, what we're trying to do here is, you know, first we say, okay, maybe this is gonna happen asymptotically, right? Maybe it's gonna happen at uh, plus or minus infinity, uh, but both of those limits are zero. So uh, that means that this value of negative 100 has to be attained somewhere in the middle ground, so to speak. And so we think about what are all the other ways that uh, functions can become quite large, in this case, large in the negative sense. And okay, that could happen at a vertical asymptote because right, it can go to negative infinity on one side and positive infinity on the other. So uh, we find the vertical asymptote, we do some arithmetic and just check that it does actually go to negative infinity on one side, and then we have to sort of adapt our intermediate value theorem to say, okay, this function is not continuous on a closed interval, uh, which includes negative one, but it is continuous on an open interval, uh, at least open on one side, that includes negative one. And then instead of being able to plug negative one in there, we do the next best thing, which is taking the limit. Okay. Hopefully uh, that's cleared up. And 